Uh, but anyway, I, I was bullied. My big brother came in and took up for me. When I got older and seemed to grow, uh, I didn't have to worry about bullies. But the lesson I learned about bullies is you don't have to fight a bully. You just have to stand in front of them and not move. And that puts it on them. They're either going to hit you or they're going to call your name and walk away because a lot of times bullies are the biggest cowards. Satan wants to bully us. But as long as we stand and not walk away, he doesn't have the power to kill you. He, can, he has the power to influence others to kill you, I'll tell you that, because that's what he does. He has people that want to come and get rid of you. That's part of the story today we're going to get into in this lesson. But I just want to make that little speech about look around you, pray for the world as it is. Uh, I don't think we're going to change it, but pray for strength and courage for those you know, we're still sitting here in America where we're relatively safe, but I'm thinking about those people in Ukraine who are running for their lives, getting out of their country. Imagine today if somebody said, they're going to invade, they've already at the beach, run. Where would you go? You know, go to the mountains, go to Mexico, go to Canada. I don't think I want to go to either one of those places. Um, or stand. Think about it. And turn to chapter 11 in Acts. Because here we see a little of all that. Uh, it starts, and we sort of went over this last week when uh, the Apostle Brothers were throughout Judea and the Gentiles also received the word of God, and Peter went up to Jerusalem. Uh, this is how that chapter starts. He deals with the circumcision party. We talked about them. And these are Jews who feel that if you're going to be a Christian, you have to be a Jew first. So these Gentiles, uh, they're not a part of it. But Peter brings the message. And the last verse, or the, not the last, but chapter, verse 18 in chapter 11 says, when they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. He's told them about Cornelius, that story, and we talked about that last week. And now these people in Jerusalem are saying, well, the Gentiles have been given salvation. That changes things. Uh, for some, it was a change they didn't like. For some, there was a change they didn't understand. Uh, for others, it made perfect sense now because their own scripture had told them from the time of Abraham that God will be the God of all people. The Jews had fallen into this we're special, you're not attitude. Uh, and a lot of them still have it today. We saw it in Israel. The, you know, We're Jews, you're not, you know, go home. But in verse 19, it says, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. Okay, you guys know your maps? We don't have a map. Where's Phoenicia? Anybody know? Phoenicia is what we call today Lebanon, just north of Israel. That was Phoenicia. And the Phoenicians were sailors and traders and colonizers. They built cities all over the Mediterranean. Cyprus. The island right off of Israel, the big island, is Cyprus. Uh, and then you have Antioch. Antioch is the other direction. It is in Syria, north uh, of Israel. So these three places become a new place of growth. Uh, it says, Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number who believed turned to the Lord. This report came to the hearers of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now, Barnabas, you'll see, is an interesting character. It seems like whenever you deal with people that nobody else wants to deal with, you send Barnabas. And he is the, the, the guy, we always think of Paul. Barnabas is actually the first to minister to the Gentiles. Uh, and he, then he's going to bring Paul along or saw along with him. Uh, but it says they sent him to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all, remain faithful to the Lord and steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, the thing in there that jumps out at me is, when did 
Saul go to Tarsus? In essence, when did he go home? He had been to Damascus. He stayed there for a while. Then he went probably to Arabia, stayed there at least three years. Then he came back to Damascus. And somewhere in between this and going to Jerusalem, maybe he went to Jerusalem then, met with Peter and James, but not with all the disciples because they still were suspicious of him. But then he goes home because he is from Tarsus. Do you all know where Tarsus is? Okay, imagine in your mind a map of Israel and then there's Turkey right above it, big Turkey sticking out into the Mediterranean. On the bottom side of that, uh, close over here is Tarsus, the city. Uh, there's a lot, I have suspicion, and it, trust me, it's just speculation. I can't prove it at all. But when Saul was in Jerusalem, he studied with Gamaliel. And he studied a lot. And it seems he may have been alone, uh, but he was a... Um, but there's a hint from Saul, or Paul, later on when he's complaining and he did complain. But he, he complained about the fact that he said, look at these other guys. Yeah, they get to take their wives with them when they go somewhere. Now, the unspoken part of that statement is, and I don't. It's like, did he have a wife? Well, custom was that if you were a rabbi, you had to be married. And he's a teacher. He's a rabbi. The one who broke that rule was Jesus. Jesus wasn't married. Um, but a lot of people, they say Jesus was. I was looking online, and I, I was reading about some stuff, and there was a thing in there. And you know how sometimes you look online, it'll give you a bunch of questions underneath, and you can click on it. One of the questions, who was Jesus' wife? I thought, what? So I clicked on it, and sure enough, Mary Magdalene. And it's just put there like it's a fact. I thought, Jesus wasn't married. Uh, Mary Magdalene was not his wife. The same way that Mary Magdalene, they said, oh, she's the whore of Magdala. There is nothing in Scripture to support that. Uh, you know, people said, well, she was a prostitute. It doesn't say that anywhere. What they did was they took the story of the woman called in adultery and ruled, rolled that in with Mary as if she was the woman called in adultery. And that became the tradition. And we can, you know, point the finger and blame the Catholic Church for that one, too. Uh, but Mary wasn't a prostitute, and she also wasn't married to Jesus. Despite what the Coptic Gospels say, you know, the, the Gospel of Judas says they were married and they kissed a lot. Well, if that's Judas talking, I don't think I would trust it anyway, but it wasn't Judas. Judas didn't write a Gospel. Anyway, I think Paul was married, and I think he went home to see his wife. And if I can take this imagination even further, I think probably the reason they didn't go together, I think probably she wouldn't go with him because she was a Jew and a Roman. He was a Jew and a Roman, now he's a Christian. You know, it would be like, what would it be like? Debbie, give me a for instance. What would you lead me for? Other than, <laughs> other than my hygienic habits? Of Harper. Harper, oh, okay. Okay, if I come home and I say, we're never gonna see Harper again. I know who'd be out the door, <laughs> and it wouldn't be Harper. <laughs> and so I'm thinking possibly, and this is all speculation. It doesn't really matter, changing anything. I'm wondering if Saul went home and said, honey, I'm a Christian now, and we're going to start a church. And she probably said, no, we ain't. I'm a Jew. And she may have left him. There may have been a divorce, but a woman can't divorce, so probably not. And that's why later on he says, you guys take your wives, I can't take my wife. That's the added part. But anyway, just interesting speculation because if that's true, that's part of his suffering. Because believe it or not, you know, if I didn't have Debbie, I would be suffering. I don't write that down. Uh, but, you know, if you have your wife, that's, that's your partner. And you want that to be your partner in everything. There's no lonelier feeling than to be married when, and have no support. From the person at home it's like you're out there and uh i think that's probably part of his suffering plus he had a pain in his side we still don't know what that was but he he's there in tarsus and barnabas says come on we're going to antioch 
And they go there and they stay in Antioch for some time and he's teaching. Now, a whole year in Antioch teaching. Who's he teaching? It appears that maybe he's joining Barnabas in teaching of the Hellenist or the Gentiles. Uh, that's, Antioch is an important foundation for the church, by the way. Uh, you, I've told you about the other main churches, but Antioch was the first church that really grew up after the persecution. And here they get the title of Christian. And nobody knows how or why. Uh, it's an interesting word. We take it for granted because we use it all the time. You're a Christian. But what does that mean? Christ follower. Follower of Christ. But why are we calling ourselves Christ followers? Have you ever thought of this one? Who used the word Christ? Jews. The Jews. It's a Jewish term for Messiah. You see, and people will fight me on this, but we weren't looking for a Messiah the Jews were. We were looking for a Savior, Emmanuel, God with us. The confusion is that the Christ was the anointed one to sit on the throne of Israel. And yet the disciples called him the Christ because they thought that's who he was. It wasn't until his resurrection that they realized he's more than that. And that's where we come in. We worship Jesus, who was the Christ, but is more. He is God in flesh. Uh, it took probably close to 30 years for some Christians to acknowledge that Jesus was God. It's taken 2,000 years for some people to do it today. Uh, I still know people that struggle with the fact that Jesus is God. Even though the Bible tells us that, he's three in one, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Trinity comes, doesn't come around until the fourth century. That's like 300 years later. And... Uh, People were saying, well, you know, he's, he's Jesus of Nazareth. He's the, the Christ. But God, wait a minute. You know, there's only one God. And so it was under the rule of Constantine that they had the big, um, I can't remember if it was Nice or Nance, anyone, one of them convocations where they said, we need to understand this. And they came up with the idea of the Trinity. And they said, Jesus is God. Uh, the Holy Spirit is God. And God is God, and they're all three the same. John puts it the best in his gospel. If you read the Gospel of John, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, uh, and so was with God. The beginning. That's Jesus. Then in Revelation, he sees it. He goes to heaven, he says, I saw God on his throne, and within God was the Lamb of God, Jesus. And so it's like, I always picture that, and I thought, it's like he's... God's transparent, and there's a, there's a little lamb inside of him or something. Yeah, I try to be literal. Uh, but it's like when he sees God on the throne, he sees all. He sees Jesus and this spiritual being and the Holy Spirit. And he can't even describe it uh, as best he can. But anyway, uh, we got that going on. Now, right there it sort of stops. And it changes gears. And it says, Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. Claudius was emperor after Caligula. Caligula was actually before Nero. So you had Caligula, Claudius, and then Nero was the emperor lineage. So this is somewhere between the worst and one of the worst. Caligula was, may have been the worst emperor that ever was, uh, and his own guard killed him. Nero was just as bad and meaner to Christians, and his own guard killed him. Claudius, by and large, was a good emperor. He was an old man. He had a limp. Uh, he had spent years in court pretending to be somewhat mentally deranged. He was the uncle to Caligula, and he was always afraid that Caligula would kill him because he had lined to the throne. And so he pretended he was crazy, and he limped everywhere. And basically, they made fun of him for years. And then when they killed Caligula, the guard said, Claudius, we know Claudius, good man. He's in line for the throne anyway. They made him, and it was, it was like really weird, because suddenly it's like he pulled off the robes, and he said, I'm not who you think I am. I'm not crazy. 
And his reign was actually pretty good. Uh, but this happens, and he, I don't know, I better not say that, but he didn't exactly know how to do his job. Let's just put it that way, because he's dealing with a famine. Now, all over the world, not really. Remember, the world they talk about, when they talk about the world in here, usually they're talking about the Mediterranean world. Uh, Egypt was the provider of grain, and they had a drought. There was another drought in Assyria, so that's what caused the famine. We know this from historical records. You can read what's known as first source writings that Rome kept good records, and they said we had uh, droughts and famine. We couldn't get grain to people. Uh, and so, and it was spread about because Egypt fed the whole Mediterranean. Believe it or not, they made enough grain. They were like our bread basket. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability should send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders and by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul, as we know, on their mission trips went out and they took an offering everywhere they went. And they sent that offering back to Jerusalem. Now, the thing that gets me is there's no grain. What's the point of having money? But like all things, if you've got money, you can find stuff. You can buy stuff. Uh, we're about to see that with gasoline. They're talking more. We might see $6 a gallon for us through it, which means I'll be riding my scooter to town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I might be back to broadcasting from home. Uh, now, chapter 12 comes about. And we have another ship. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now, there's a little confusion here because James, the brother of John, but in some manuscripts, it was James, the brother of Jesus. And people got confused because there's too many James for one thing, there's too many Johns. Um, but I, I, for a long time, I thought this was James, the brother of Jesus. And James, the brother of Jesus, was the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He was the spokesman. Peter was the sort of the power, and, and James was the spokesman. And there was often some confusion. Oh, I can't read the time. I thought it was 25 hours. Okay, I thought it was already 45 hours. Anyway, uh, so James is not the guy who's speaking for the church. There was no problem here. But you do know this, James. He is one of the sons of thunder. If you remember back when the two brothers says, well, we want to sit on your right hand. Uh, this is John, who was one of the sons of thunder, as they go, who wanted to be a leader in, in the church. Uh, but this is the first apostle, the second martyr. Stephen was the first, and this is the first well-known martyr. He's beheaded. By Herod. And Herod, the king, says, well, you know, the people liked it. Now, I think this is a select audience of like, because these are the Jews. I'm sure the Christians didn't like this a whole lot. But he's listening to the Jews, and they said, hey, this is great. You know, you need to kill more of these guys, because persecution had started. It had spread. But remember, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And partly because they felt like, well, these guys have a little too much influence. We're not going to mess with them. But Herod went the next step and said, forget that. I'm killing this guy. So they chopped his head off. And the people said, good, get rid of him. And so he thought, well, this is good. So I'm going after the top dog. Remember, they've already held two trials with Peter. And Herod says, go get Peter and bring him in here, arrest him. And they did. And here we have this interesting story that a lot of people like to preach about. And there's been songs written about it and everything. Peter is taken, they put him in prison with four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover they're going to bring him to the people. So he's in prison, he's praying, uh, and think about, go back to the four squads. Uh, in, the, in the military day, or it used to be, a squad was like four men in a rank. I think it's more than that now. And I'm not exactly sure what a squad was in, in the Roman, but these are not Romans. These are Jewish temple guards, so we're not sure how many four squads were, but it's got to be more than four or five people. So you might say, well, this is anywhere from 16 to 20 men guarding him in prison. Now, it says, when Herod was about to bring him out, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound by two chains 
and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him. It's getting a little crowded in there. And a light shone into the cell. I love this part. Uh, my Bible says, he struck Peter on the side. Yeah, that's how mom used to wake me up. No gentle words. Like, poke that guy and get him out of bed. So Peter wakes up, and he says, get up quickly. And when he, he does, the chains fall off his hands. The angel says, put your clothes on, put your shoes on. And he did. He said, now wrap up your cloak and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He didn't know what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. So here he is. He's just woke up. You ever woke up from a dream that seems so real you think you're still in the dream? When I get one of those, I try to go back because I want to go back to that dream state because uh, I liked it a lot. Yeah, it's like dreaming about being locked in a donut factory. I don't want to wake up. Yeah. So Peter is in this daze where it's like, is this a vision? Is this a dream? What's going on? And he's probably stumbling around. This angel said, come on, come on, come on. And when they passed the first and second guard, they came to an iron gate leading to the city. It just opened up of its own accord. They went out, went along one street, and immediately the angel left him. So put yourself in his position. You're sleeping on the floor with a guy on either side of you. That's scary enough. The chains fall off. The first thing I would think about was, shh, chains fall off. And then it's like the angel's talking to him. It's like, guy's here. Put your clothes on, put your shoes on, let's get out of here, wrap up, you know. That sounds like mom said, we're going to school. And uh, all he goes, he goes right past some guards guarding the door. You know, I'm thinking I'd be looking at these guys like, do you not see me? And obviously they didn't. Door opens by itself. He goes out, and, and as soon as he's out into the street where he's relatively safe, angel disappears. So he says, when Peter came to himself, that's verse 11, and he said, now I'm sure the Lord has sent an angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people who were expecting. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. Now, he remember Mark? His name was John. It's like, give us a break here. Think of a new name. <laughs> How many Bobs are there? <laughs> Mike. Yeah, do you know Mike? Mike's in order. But Mark is the kid that was at the Lord's Supper that also probably saw and heard Jesus in the garden. And he probably was around 13. And his other name was John Mark, or I think it was John Mark. And uh, so they're going to his house because that's where they had the Lord's Supper. So Peter said, I'm going over here. And um, they were gathered there together and everybody was praying. And when he knocked on the door at the gateway, and this is where the story gets really hilarious, a servant girl named Rhoda, well, at least it's a new name. And she had a sitcom on TV. Yeah. Rhoda came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice. In her joy, she didn't open the door, but ran and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. And they said to her, I love this. You're crazy. You are out of a teenager. Probably had a These people thought that Peter had an angel, or Peter was an angel. We're not sure it says it's his angel. It become an angel. There's people today that believe when you die, it become an angel. It, it drives me crazy. I mean, because I've heard so many people say when someone dies, they say, well, the Lord need another angel. And I want to think, that's a demotion. You know, we don't become angels, folks. I hate to break it to you. Uh, what they are cranking out is citizens of heaven who will be children of God. Angels are not children of God. Angels really got sort of a raw deal when you think about it, if you want to humanize an angel. But guess what? We don't really see where angels had a lot of emotion. An angel is more like a toaster. than use power, morality, consciousness. And angels can't be saved. You think, what? Uh the angels that are condemned to hell are because they rebelled in their spirit. The other angels, they don't need to be saved because they're always angels. They live in heaven. They're with God. You know, this is something we forget about Satan. Satan was the first created being, created angel, and he was created perfect. And in that, the perfection, the problem with perfection was he knew he was perfect. And somewhere along the way, God allowed him, and this, hold on to your hats, 
God maybe even made him to be perfect and prideful. He gave him something that he didn't give the other angels. That pride. Now you say, no, come on, Brooks. Angel turned bad. I don't think God would have created a being that had the capability of turning bad as an angel. He created us and gave us that capability. He gave us the freedom of choice, which makes us unique in all creation. Angels didn't really have choice, and yet Satan did. And what does Satan do with it? And this is, this is my theory, and it, it's probably upsetting, but it seems to make more sense. I believe angels, that Satan was created to be Satan, that it, he was intended to be evil all along, because without evil, there is no choice. So why would he give humans free will if they had no will to choose from? There had to be a balance, good and evil. You have to have both to choose. If there's only good, it's sort of like saying, it's like a Russian election. Okay, today we're voting for Putin. Nobody's running against him, but you can still vote. So you're going to vote for Putin or not vote? I'm not voting. Well, you're going to get arrested because you're supposed to vote. Go vote for Putin. Everybody votes for Putin. If we only have good to choose, we're only going to choose good. And everybody says, well, that would have been great. Why didn't we do that? We would have been, we, yeah, been like angels. Plus, we would not have been able to rise to the level of understanding of God. Angels don't fully understand God. We see that over in the verse where it says that when they talk about grace, the angels come to listen because they don't understand grace because they've never been forgiven, because they've never really been told that you can be forgiven and achieve something higher, because they don't become humans. They were made angels. They stay angels for eternity. Now, the angels that followed Satan's lead were allowed to become demonic presences, and they're all over the place. I don't even know how many are here, but they're all over the earth. The problem with this teaching is that people today have become too sophisticated, and they say... <laughs> That's just crazy, Brooks. That is a myth. That the devil and there's demons. You would you'd be amazed at how many preachers teach now that there's God and there's angels, but there's no devil. There's no demons. There's no demonic possession. That's you just, just look around you and see that there is. Though. But you know they blame that not on demons. They blame it on man's failings. In other words, there's no demon influencing me to be evil. That's just me being evil. And so that way. Satan achieves his greatest desire. You know what Satan's greatest desire is? To make you think he doesn't exist. Uh, they said that there's an old saying where he says, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was making us think he wasn't there. Or something to like that. Usual suspects. Yeah, that was in that movie. But that was before that movie too. But it's true. Satan uh, has always been in the background. Guess what though? Look around you. He's come out of the closet. Uh, there is more Satan worship going on, and it's not crazy Satan worship anymore. You know, used to, when I, when, when I lived in uh, Caldwell County, we had a section of town which was down beside the river, and uh, it was just the place you don't go because there was roads going off into the woods that didn't go anywhere. Uh, but that is where they found mutilated animals all the time, and they find goat's head crosses on everything, and they said, that's where the Satan worshipers go. So you didn't go there. Of course, we did. Uh, it's like, don't go there. Let's go tonight. <laughs> and me and Brad, Moose and Woody, we'd head down there looking for Satan worshipers. But these Satan worshipers, you know, it was more like the cartoon characters. They like to sit around and, and do this and say, I'm casting a spell on you. It's like, well, make me rich. But there were several people in our town that were considered Satan worshipers. There was a witch who lived in Mortonton. That don't go there so we went there every Halloween just to see the people outside our house uh, you know it, it, it was just a, a carnival atmosphere but guess what's happening now now there are churches to Satan uh, have y'all seen the big statue that they made with the, the devil that it's got children on either side of them and that stuff and they go and they worship that beast and uh, this stuff. now Satan has come out of the closet as a, another form of worship another religion and the people are saying i like this satan guy yeah you know, he doesn't make us feel so bad like god makes us feel guilty satan makes us feel good and so satan is emerging again 
in here. <laughs> it's been foretold already. Satan is emerging. He is no longer hiding behind uh, you and me. He's coming out in the open and saying, listen to me. I'm trying to give you a better life. God is such a downer. All he wants you to do is worship him. Just imagine spending eternity singing holy, holy, holy. Is that not boring? You know, I'm going to have fun. We're going to have fun. Anyway, so this idea here of being an angel, I, I know I got way off on a tangent, but uh, they thought it was an angel. So let me pick the story back up. I want to go a little further. Uh, so they opened the door. Peter continued knocking. When they opened the door, they saw him were amazed. This is verse 17. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, which I think I do that if they're screaming. You know, he's like, Shh, I just broke out of jail. Yeah. Uh, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. Now, when I first read that, I thought, does he not know that James is dead? Or is he talking about the other James, which is spokesman of the church, probably? Because James was killed before he was arrested. So he probably knows that James the younger is dead. And he says, tell James, the, the guy who's my spokesman. And uh, then he departed and went to another place. And they, they don't tell us. Now, when the day came and there was no, uh, no little disturbance among the soldiers over what had happened to come of Peter, and after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. So Herod gets thwarted. Peter's loose. Uh, so he takes these soldiers out and executes them, which, by the way, that was standard procedure. You know, if, if you fall asleep, Romans were rougher. If you fall asleep on, on the job, you're executed on the spot uh, if you if your unit loses in battle you know say you're with your little cohort and they retreat or they they lose they do what's known as decimation this was a Roman practice uh, and decimation was they lined up every soldier 500 of them in the cohort and they walked down the line counting one two three four five six, seven eight nine ten tenth guy they pull out. Tenth guy, that, every tenth guy they pulled out, and they murdered him on the spot. That's decimation. So if you're a Roman soldier, you now have the desire not to retreat. You're going to fight to the death because if you don't, you could be one of those ten in the next time. So they kill him. Motivation: don't want to work for them. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded. Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. So he goes to Caesarea. Now Caesarea, remember, that's where the pilot usually hangs out, and there's uh, that cohort was there. And so he's there, and he's talking about Tyre and Sidon. Those two cities have done something. Now, what we think they've done was they had a large Christian presence there. And so because there's a Christian presence there, Herod says, withhold their food allotment. In other words, no food for you. Get rid of the Christians, might send you some grain. So they talked to Blastus, who it's another name. Thank goodness it's not John or Mark or something. But Blastus, which I wouldn't mind having a name like that. That sounds tough, you know, Blastus. It's like Hulk. Anyway, uh, he's a chamberlain, and they said, we want peace. Uh, we depend on the food. And on an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes took his seat upon the throne and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. Okay, now let's think for a second. If I get up and I give a sermon, you know, and people think, oh, get sermon books, that's being polite. But if I promise everybody who likes my sermon a thousand dollars, that may become the best sermon that's ever been preached. I don't know. He's a oh, that world's fan. He is like Billy Graham on steroids. I mean, well, you're right. Okay. Uh, this is sort of what happened to Herod. He's here with a bunch of hungry people. They're not going to say, well, that was a mediocre speech. No, they want food from this guy. So they're saying, this is the greatest speech ever, the voice of a God. And Herod's there like, you're right. Give him some bologna or something. Uh, but look what happens. And the people were shouting, the voice of a God, not a man. Immediately, 
an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And I love his last. Now, you, you see the irony here. This whole thing was about food. The interesting thing here, too, is they make it sound like God's angry because he didn't get credit for anything. I don't know if that's exactly true. Uh, like I said, my sermon that I was so proud of a minute ago, if I take credit for that, I lose credibility in God's eyes because it's like you're not serving me, you're serving yourself. He was a music minister. And we were talking about this one day about the 700 Club, and I said, well, I just, I'm a little leery of these people that are making all this money and stuff. And uh, Bert said, I was saved through the ministry of the 700 Club. He said, I listened to them, the preaching, and I believed it, and I became a Christian. And I thought for a minute, I thought, well, I can't exactly say Bert's not a Christian. He is a Christian. He's a good guy. So that ministry did do good for him. It served him. And there's a verse out, I should have marked it for today, but Paul one day is, is there, and it's toward the end of his life, and some of his fellows come in, and they say, Paul, there's guys over there, and they're preaching, and, and they're preaching in the name of Jesus. And, but they're not Christians. They're not part of us. What should we do? And Paul has the strangest answer. It really sort of bothered me because I wouldn't think he'd say that, but he says, I don't care. As long as Jesus is being preached, that's all that's important. Are they getting it right? He didn't say that. I added that. But basically he's saying, if they're preaching Jesus and they're getting it right, leave them alone. Because it's not who they are. It's who they preach. And so suddenly it's almost like Paul says, all these fake preachers, leave them alone. If some people are getting the truth out of it, they do need to hear it that way. Some people respond to a message that maybe I would respond to. Um, not long ago, I was having a conversation with a guy and he was talking about his ministry, but he's also talking about his habits, which were sort of bad. And I said, maybe the fundamentalist. I always had this idea that you have to be a fundamentalist, even though I wasn't a good fundamentalist. So I've had to rethink a little bit and I think, you know, Brooks, don't go try to clean out all the bad preachers and stuff. Try to clean out all the bad sin. And so I, I sort of had to change my stance. I still struggle with people like Benny Hinn and Joel Osteen, to be honest with you, but maybe they're reaching somebody that we're not. But the thing I worry about is, are they reaching some people with inaccurate messages? And that's what scares me a little bit. I know a lot of people love Joel Osteen and they buy his books, but I just wish people realized that Joel Osteen is not preaching theology. He's preaching basically, uh, I've lost my mind what's the word I'm looking for, you know, where he's just building people up, uh, motivational speaker. He is a great motivational speaker, but he's not teaching theology. He's using Jesus to motivate people. And maybe that's not bad. I don't know. I have to struggle. Benny Hinn, he pretty much has given up his preaching. I don't even see him much out anymore. He used to do these crusades where he's healing everybody and their brother and knocking people down with a wave of his hand. And I thought, that's got to be a charlatan. He's got three mansions and 50 Mercedes and all this stuff. He's made his. And so, you know, I, I do question it. So I, that's my problem. And you might have the same problem. But in a way, it's not for us to worry about. It's not for us to sort out. It's for us to be ourselves. Let's have a word of prayer and let's go to church and thank you for listening to me ramble on for a long time. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come today and to share in these teachings to see how you work with the life of Peter and the followers and how you were present to save, to lift up, and to bring them out of danger. God, we look ahead at our, our life and the days around us. There are very dangerous days and there are more dangerous days coming. So give us strength and courage and the faith to endure. Remember those we have listed today for prayer. Lord, be with them and strengthen them. And help us, God, to, to be there for them and be the people you want us to be throughout the world. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Uh, this ought to be an interesting lesson because it kept turning on and off. <laughs>